Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. It is both inspiring and a little scary how well humans can adapt to horrible conditions, particularly children. Leo Vardia Shively left his home country of Georgia as it was undergoing a civil war, but not before he and his buddies invented a game that involved collecting shell casings on their way home from school. The main character in his debut novel leads a similar life. The book is titled Hard by a Great Forest, and Vardia Shively spoke to NPR's Scott Simon about it and about how Georgians tend to laugh at adversity because they have to. That's after the break. This message comes from Apple Card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase. That's 3% on products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. Leo Vardyashvili's new novel is about a family that's trying to find themselves again through the thick forests of lost history and, yes, fearsome woods. Saba and Sandro come to London with their father, Iraqli, in 1992 as civil war breaks out in Georgia after the fall of the Soviet Union the author sets the scene from the very first. Where's Eka? We must have asked a thousand times. Our mother stayed so that we could escape. You see, war trumps most things. You'll find that a volley of AK-47 rounds fired right down your street will override almost any other concern. We heard gunfire by night and saw brass twinkling on the pavement in the morning, as though it had rained shell casings all over Tbilisi. Sounds manageable so far. But when a stray tank shell breaks the sound barrier by a bedroom window, screams on and deletes the corner grocery shop and the entire family living above it, you will begin to make plans. That is Leo Vardyashvili, whose family came to London when he was 12. His novel is Hard by a Great Forest. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Scott. It's a pleasure. Fair to say a lot of your own experience wound into this novel, isn't it? It's very fair to say, yes. Um, I'm similar to the main character in that I left Georgia not as early. I actually stayed there through the Civil War, but we left in 95 and came to the UK as refugees. And the main character was in the same uh, situation going back to Georgia. Mm -hmm. He went back reluctantly. I I went back willingly um, and I didn't have to contend with the escaped zoo animals and so on that that go on in the novel. Well, I I want to ask about that and so much else. We also want to make plain your mother was able to come, unlike the mother in this novel, but but your grandmother couldn't, right? My grandmother I never got to see again. Um, We exchanged letters, obviously, um, and back then we used to do this thing where um, we would send tapes, voice recordings, rather than letters. But I I never really got to see her again, and and that was quite upsetting. It's one of those things that sticks around as an effect of war, once the cameras and the reporters have left. It's the stuff that you don't really see. Yeah. And may I ask you about that time in your life? Because I've, I've, I've read a piece you wrote that, that you had a game with shell casings. I did, yes. Um, I don't remember the Civil War badly. I know that's a weird thing to say, but I was 12. Um, so I was still a kid. And the shell casings game was simply us collecting shell casings on the way to school and then comparing them and arguing over who had the best one. Um, but that's children for you. I guess they don't always see the, yeah. the seriousness of, of what's going on. In your novel, Hard by a Great Forest, uh, as we said, the mother dies and the father years later decides to return to Georgia. But then the sons get a message. It's pretty blunt, isn't it? It is, and it sets up the central mystery. So the message is essentially, do not follow me. I've left a trail that I can't erase. Do not follow me. So, of course, in the traditional kind of mystery style, they ignore his um, instructions and follow him. So it's the oldest son that goes and follows him first and finds this trail. And surprise, surprise, he disappears also. So it's up to Saba, who's the youngest, the, the youngest son, He's essentially alone in the world at this point, Uh, no other family. So he has no choice but to go back to Georgia and find this breadcrumb trail and try and find his father and and brother. And tell us about the wild animals that run through the story. It's the strangest part, the strangest element in the book, I think, 
But it's actually, it, it really did happen. In 2015, there was a flash flooding in Tbilisi, and the zoo happens to be along the river. Uh, therefore, all the fences were washed away, and literally the entire zoo got emptied into the city. Um, so a lot of the details of the the hippo, the wolves running around Tbilisi, and the scary Bengal tiger, uh, which makes an appearance in the novel. I won't spoil anything there, but that all really did happen. So when, when I saw that article on the BBC, I think it was, I thought, this is too good to pass up. I have to include this. Are we right to see it as a metaphor as well? Someone pointed this out to me recently that I hadn't picked up on it, even though I wrote the damn book myself. But the animals are themselves refugees. So they've been freed by from their home. Or they've escaped their home and they find themselves in alien surroundings trying to make their way through this city, which kind of reflects the, the themes of the novel, doesn't it? Yeah. Tell us about your trip back to Georgia. It sounds extraordinary. My first trip, it was like time traveling. Uh, we got on the plane. I was fine. I got off the plane and I time traveled into my childhood. I didn't realize how much of Tbilisi and my neighborhood I would actually recognize. I kind of thought I'd go into it like a blank slate and it would all be new to me. But surprisingly, I remembered almost everything. Um, and that freaked me out a little bit, to be honest. And that was the inception of me starting to write this novel is trying to make sense of it, even just to myself. What about your bus trip, or should I say lack of a bus trip one day? Oh, the lack of the bus trip. It's a perfect summary of, of Georgian hospitality, which if you look at travel guides for Georgia, they always mention the hospitality of the, of the people of Georgia. But essentially, I was just outside of Tbilisi in a, in a tiny village, and the last bus just didn't turn up. These things happen in Georgia sometimes. But I was stuck in a in a village that had maybe 10 10 homesteads or houses on it. The hike into Tbilisi would have been a few hours. I was kind of stuck. And a farmer came across me on the way home, I suppose. And he, he kind of went, there's, there's no bus, mate, until half six tomorrow. And then he kind of just casually motioned me to come with him as though that was a normal, acceptable thing. And I, I did go along with him and I stayed at his, his house. Um, what I didn't realize is they literally offered me their best food and put me up in this room, which was heated. And I didn't realize that the rest of the house wasn't heated. So they literally, they treated me like some kind of royalty, which is a very Georgian thing to do. Uh, a guest is a gift from God. And that's the proverb that gets mentioned a lot in the novel. And, and people really do live by that. Yeah. What do you wish the West would understand about Georgia and Georgians? Stories like that? Stories like that, yes, for sure. Just the Georgian mentality of smiling in the face of adversity. I think that's very key, especially these days. There is a saying in Georgian that if if you can still laugh at a situation or a hardship, it hasn't beaten you yet. And as soon as you stop laughing, then you might be in trouble. So that I love that about the Georgian people, that they will take the darkest um, situation and make a joke and have you falling out of your chair laughing at it. Leo Vardishvili, his novel, Hard by a Great Forest. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for having me. When Argentina won the World Cup, it meant so much to so many people. But there's one person in particular for whom it meant everything. Soccer legend Lionel Messi. In The Last Cup, a bilingual podcast series, I explore why. Listen now to The Last Cup podcast from NPR and Futuro Studios. This message comes from NPR sponsor Sony Pictures Classics presenting Wicked Little Letters, a new comedy starring Olivia Colman and Jesse Buckley based on an outrageously true scandal. Wicked Little Letters starts Friday in New York and Los Angeles everywhere April 5th, only in theaters. This message comes from NPR sponsor Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, inflation is everywhere. So Mint Mobile is offering premium wireless starting at just $15 a month. To get your new phone plan for just $15, go to mintmobile.com slash switch.